This hearing will uh, come to order. Without objection, all members' opening statements will be made part of the record. The chair notes that some members may have additional questions for this panel, which they may wish to submit in writing. Without objection, the hearing record will remain open for 30 days for members to submit written questions to this witness and to place his responses in the, in the record. I want to uh, welcome our witness today, uh, President Honig, and I will o open up the hearing with an uh, opening statement from myself. You know, over the years, uh, I've been interested in the uh, transparency of the Fed, and the Fed's been interested in the independence of the Fed. But uh, since I know what Mr. Honig is uh, interested in, I think he truly represents the right kind of independence that I like, because uh, he's, he's a rare individual to be at the Fed, uh, or at, on occasion to be a member of the FOMC. But I want to note that uh, last year, when uh, just virtually everybody was endorsing, endorsing and welcoming uh, QE2, uh, he was dissenting against this position, I believe, about eight times. So that, to me, is uh, truly remarkable and shows that he's obviously an independent thinker. My interest, of course, uh, in the monetary system has been related to the accumulation of debt. I believe they are related and that uh, size of government uh, uh, is uh, indirectly affected by monetary policy as well. If uh, debt can be easily monetized, uh, the temptation for Congress to spend money uh, is, is always there. And I think that is a, a big, big distortion. And um, he, uh, uh, Mr. Honig, has, has uh, made his points made very clear that uh, maybe interest rates of zero to a half percent might be too much and actually has said, made statements about uh, part of our problem getting prior to the crash uh, of 08 was the fact that interest rates were too low uh, for uh, too long. And I often think about and like to clarify and expand as much as possible the relationship of uh, the problems that we have today to our privilege of issuing the reserve currency of the world. Obviously, nobody quite has that same benefit, and therefore, uh, our debt and our bubbles uh, can get far more exaggerated than uh, if you're an independent country and your debt is uh, numbered in a currency that the world doesn't accept like they accept our dollars. So though that might be a very positive thing uh, on the short run and give us some benefits, it also may be misleading to us uh, because it is deceiving in thinking that uh, this process can go on, on forever. Uh, today we're in the middle of a default crisis. We're worrying about whether the national debt is going to be increased. And I have an opinion that um, the default, once it gets so big, once the debt gets so big, default is uh, virtually impossible to stop and that the default that we're worrying about right now is not, you know, strange and brand new because in many ways our country has defaulted. If you look at uh, the, the inability to follow up on the promises to pay a gold certificate in the, uh, in the 1930s, that was a form of default, and then we promised to pay foreigners, uh, you know, gold for $35, and we eventually had to quit doing that, and then we promised to pay the American citizens uh, a dollar for a silver certificate, and we defaulted on that, and eventually those silver certificates were not worth uh, a silver dollar, but they were, worth, uh, they were then worth a Federal Reserve note. And uh, even in 1978, we met a major crisis, it was a dollar crisis, and uh, we were not able to maintain the value of the dollar, and we, had, we went hat in hand to the, federal, uh, to the IMF and actually got approximately 25 to $30 billion of boost uh, to prop up our dollar at that time. So for me, that's a form of default, and I believe we've embarked on a system where default is going to come. And I think the argument in the impasse is because nobody wants to really admit that the default is here and we have to face up to it. The argument is how do we default? Are we going to quit, paying, quit sending the checks out, 
or are we going to do the ordinary thing that countries have done for years and that we continually do, and that is we pay off our debt with money with a lot less value? To me, that is a default, but I see that as being unfair because some people suffer more than others, and uh, therefore we will eventually be pushed into some serious talks about monetary reform, which I believe are actually occurring already in international circles. But my five minutes has uh, passed, and now I will uh, yield to Mr. Clay five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for conducting this hearing on the uh, impact of monetary policy uh, and the state of the economy. The Full Employment and Balance Growth Act of 1978, better known as Humphrey Hawkins, set four benchmarks for the economy full employment, growth in production, price stability, and the balance of trade and budget. The Humphrey Hawkins Act also charges the Federal Reserve with a dual mandate, maintaining stable prices and promoting full employment. According to the Department of Labor, in June, the nation's unemployment rate was 9.2%. Over 14 million Americans are looking for work. Another 5 million are un underemployed at jobs that pay much less than they previously earned and offer few benefits. And in urban areas like the district that I represent in St. Louis, the unemployment rate among African Americans and other minorities is over 16% percent. The majority party has been in power in this House for over 200 days, and yet we have not seen one jobs bill, and America is still waiting. I'm eager to hear what additional steps the Federal Reserve is willing to take to free up the flow of credit to small businesses and encourage major banks to finally invest in this recovery instead of sitting on the sidelines with trillions of dollars that could be creating millions of jobs. I also look forward to the witnesses' comments regarding what other urgent steps Congress can take to spur private sector job growth and restore confidence uh, in our economic future. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Now I yield to Mr. Lukemeyer. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing today and continuing the dialogue. I first want to recognize today's witness, President Tom Hunt, has been a voice for reason and fiscal conservatism during a time when many of our economic policies have been weak. Tom has often been a lone dissenter who has encouraged sound economic principles over politically expedient ones. Our nation is grateful for his service. President Honing has expressed concern over the Federal Reserve monetary policies. Personally, I remain troubled by the expansionary role the Fed seems to have been championing over the last several years. What is more upsetting is the fact that we don't seem to be any closer to changing course and abandoning these policies, even though they don't seem to have worked. While the third of a third round of quantitative easing looms, our economy remains stagnant. Our jobless rate continues to hover above 9 percent. Bank lending is still constrained and we have seen little evidence of a long-term economic growth. Abroad, the credit markets have indicated that austere measures be taken by troubled governments. We are headed down an identical path. Since 2008, the Fed has purchased several trillion dollars of U.S. Treasuries, many of which are still held by the bank. We have been warned time and time again that unless we get our fiscal house in order, our credit rating is likely to be downgraded. Considering the amount of Treasuries held by the Fed, the solvency of our central bank will undoubtedly be affected by this downgrade should it occur. The current state of our, e of our economy combined with the problems we could face in the near future results in a recipe for economic distress. The Fed must begin to seriously examine the policies in place and plan for worst case scenarios that could overwhelm our nation in coming months. Congress rarely hears from the 12 re regional Fed presidents. This is unfortunate given their role as a financial regulator in our communities and as an independent voting member on the Federal Open Market Committee. I appreciate President Holding's willingness to be here today. I look forward to his testimony. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. 
I thank the gentleman. I yield now to uh, Mr. Green from Texas. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for appearing today, sir. I trust that um, you will find our committee hospitable. <laughs> I, um, I think that we have many concerns that we can address, and of course, I'm concerned about inflation, concerned about unemployment, uh, concerned about the uh, quantitative easing and the possibility of another round of quantitative easing. But I must also say to you, I still believe in America, and I really don't want this to come across as uh, we have lost faith uh, in the country that has uh, produced so much for so many. Uh, America is still a pretty good place to live, pretty good place to uh, have your dreams, your hopes, and your aspirations fulfilled. So as we, or as I, I'll speak for myself, as I uh, make my queries and uh, make uh, my inquiries known, I, I don't want to give the impression that, that I don't, uh, I no longer have faith and belief in this, the greatest country in the world. Um, I am concerned, sir, about the widening gap and I'm not sure that you can address this, but uh, if you have some intelligence that you will share, I, I would appreciate it. But the widening gap between uh, what we commonly call haves and have-nots, uh, that's a real concern. I've seen some uh, information published indicating that uh, Latinos, African Americans, and uh, Asians have had a great widening in the gap between these groups and uh, some others, that concerns me. I'm also concerned about this uh, crisis that y you have very little control over. You may be able to influence it, but little control, and that's the raising of the debt ceiling, as we call it. The ceiling is uh, something that has become a crisis, but it really is a political problem that has uh, somehow developed a, uh, evolved into a crisis, a political problem that has evolved into an economic crisis, if you will, only because the politics have not uh, come together appropriately. And I still believe that we'll get it right. I think that there's still time for us to raise the debt ceiling. But these are some of the concerns that I hope you'll be able to address today from your regional perch. Uh, I think highly of you, and I am interested in hearing your views. I have a lot of respect for you, and I thank you for appearing. I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Now I yield to the uh, full committee's chairman, uh, Mr. Bacchus. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Paul. I commend you for uh, holding this hearing to examine the state of the economy from the perspective of a regional F Federal Reserve Bank president. And I thank you for uh, inviting Governor Honig, who I consider to be a superb regional uh, president. Uh, Tom Honig, or Dr. Honig, uh, Honig is the longest serving of the 12 uh, presidents of the regional Federal Reserve Banks. Perhaps happily for him, but sadly for many of us who admire his wisdom, he is soon to retire from that post. Uh, you will be missed. Uh, Dr. Honig has been a steadfast, independent voice among those in the inner circle of Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke and before that Chairman Alan Greenspan. He has been particularly outspoken recently in cautioning against the overly stimulative efforts of the Fed, including the so-called QE2 quantitative easing program that ended last month after uh, adding an additional $600 billion and bonds onto the federal, the Fed's balance sheet. Uh, the New York Times said that uh, Dr. Honig's cautious views, clearly shaped by having worked at the Kansas City Fed during the runaway inflation of the 1970s and the bank failures of the 80s, and I quote, seem rooted in an agrarian and populist tradition that is mistrustful of concentrations of power, end quote. Oh, I think that's a healthy fear. 
Uh, it is not surprisingly then that uh, Dr. Honig has spoken forcefully on the subject of downsizing the biggest of the country's large bank, including a 2009 speech he titled, Too Big Has Failed. Uh, I can tell you that on this side of the aisle that many of us uh, are in wholehearted agreement with you. And uh, we have looked on with alarm as there's been a greater and greater concentration of, uh, quote, too big to fail uh, institutions. Uh, I mention all this uh, not only to salute you, Dr. Honig, for your career and your, uh, uh, your I guess, bravery uh, in speaking out, but also to make a comparison between your views and uh, with the view that is held by some in Washington that regional Fed presidents should not be allowed to vote on monetary policy moves made by the Federal Open Market Committee. Somehow, uh, this view holds that regional Fed presidents are captive of big business and the industry. And uh, I can tell you that you're a very good exhibit against that. In fact, I, I think that more often than not, uh, our regional banks are more attuned to Main Street. And, uh, of course, uh, you're not the only independent thinker among the regional bank presidents, but uh, your appearance here today will serve as a good rebuttal to the view that the Federal Reserve Bank Board of Governors and Washington, D.C. need less input from the regional feds and the rest of the country. Actually, they need more. So thank you, Doctor. And I yield back the uh, balance of my time. I thank the chairman. And uh, if there are no other opening statements, we'll go to the uh, introduction of the witness. I want to welcome Dr. Thomas uh, Honig, uh, who has been the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City for the past uh, 20 years and is the longest serving policymaker at the Fed. While a voting member of the Federal Open Market Committee in 2010, he voted against keeping interest rates at zero, casting the only no vote on all eight FOMC, three, uh, FOMC meetings. He has been a vocal critic of the Fed's zero interest rate policy and QE2. He will be retiring in October, having reached the Fed's requirement retirement age of 65. Uh, Mr. Honing, you're free to recognize. Thank you, Chairman Paul and members of the subcommittee. Uh, I want to thank you for this opportunity to discuss my views on the economy from the perspective of a president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City and, as you said, a 20-year member of the Federal Open Market Committee. The Federal Reserve's mandate, uh, if I can just read for a second, states that the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System and the Federal Open Market Committee shall maintain long-run growth of the monetary and credit aggregates commensurate with the economy's long-run potential to increase production so as to promote effectively the goals of maximum employment, stable prices, and moderate long-term interest rates. Within the context, then, of long-run, I see the role of the central bank is, in fact, to provide liquidity in a crisis and to create and foster an environment that supports long-run economic health. For that reason, as the financial crisis took hold in 2008, I supported the FOMC's cuts to the federal funds rate that pushed the target range between 0 and 0.25 percent, as well as other emergency liquidity actions taken to staunch the crisis. However, though I would support a generally accommodated monetary policy today, I have raised questions regarding the advisability of keeping the emergency monetary policy in place for 32 months with the promise of keeping it there for an extended period. I have several concerns with zero rates. First, a guarantee of zero rates affects the allocation of resources. It is generally accepted that no good, service, or transaction trades efficiently at the price of zero. Credit is no exception. Rather, a zero rate policy increases the risk of misallocating real resources, creating a new set of imbalances or possibly a new set of bubbles. For example, in the 10th Federal Reserve District, 
fertile farmland was selling for $6,000 an acre just two years ago. That land today is selling for as much as $12,000 an acre, reflecting high commodity prices, but also the fact that farmland loans increasingly carry an interest rate of far less than 7.5%, the historic average for such loans. And with such low rates of return on financial assets, investors are quickly bidding up the price of farmland in search of a marginally better return. I was in the banking supervision area during um, the banking crisis of the 1980s, when the collapse of a speculative bubble dramatically and negatively affected the agriculture, real estate, and energy industries almost simultaneously. Because of this bubble in the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City's district alone, I was involved in the closing of nearly 350 regional and community banks. Farms were lost, communities were devastated, and thousands of jobs were lost in the energy and real estate sectors. I am confident that a highly accommodative monetary policy of the decade of the 1970s contributed to that crisis. Another important effect of zero rates is that it redistributes wealth in this country from the saver to the debtor by pushing interest rates on deposits and other types of assets below what they would otherwise be. This requires savers and those on fixed incomes to subsidize borrowers. This may be necessary during a crisis in order to avoid even more dire outcomes, but the longer it continues, the more dramatic the redistribution of wealth. In addition, historically low rates affect the incentives of how the largest banks allocate assets. They can borrow for essentially a quarter point and lend it back to the federal government for purchasing bonds and notes that pay about 3%. It provides them a means to generate earnings and restore capital, but it also reflects a subsidy to their operations. It is not the Federal Reserve's job to pave the yield curve with guaranteed returns for any sector of the economy, and we should not be guaranteeing a return for Wall Street or any special interest groups. Finally, my view is that unemployment is too high, in part because of interest rates were held to an artificially low level during the period of the early 2000s. In 2003, unemployment at 6.5% was thought to be just too high. The federal funds rate was continuously lowered to a level of 1% in an effort to avoid deflation and to lower unemployment. The policy worked, but only in the short run. The full effect, however, was that the U.S. experienced a credit boom with consumers increasing their debt from about 80% of their disposable income to 125%. Banks increased their leverage ratios, asset to equity capital, from around 15 to 1 to 30 to 1. This very active credit environment persisted over time and contributed to the bubble in the housing market. In just five years, the housing bubble collapsed and asset values have fallen dramatically. The debt levels, however, remain imp impeding our ability to recover from this recession. I would argue that the result of our short-run focus in 2003 was to contribute to 10 percent unemployment five years later. That said, I am not advocating for tight monetary policy. I'm advocating that the FOMC carefully, carefully move to a non-zero rate. This will allow the market to begin to read credit conditions and allocate resources according to their best use rather than in response to artificial incentives. More than a year ago, I advocated removing the extended period language to prepare the market for a move to 1 percent by the fall of 2010. Then, depending on how the economy performed, I would move rates back towards more historic levels. I want to see people back to work, but I want them back to work with some assurance of stability. I want to see our economy grow in a manner that encourages stable economic growth, stable prices, and long-run full employment. If zero rates could accomplish this goal, then I would support interest rates at zero. Monetary policy, though, cannot solve every problem. I believe we put the economy at greater risk by attempting to do so. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I do look forward to the committee's questions. I thank you for your uh, statement, and I would like to ask, without objection, your written statement will be made part of the record as well. Thank you. I would like now to uh, yield to Mr. Backus for any questions he would like to ask. Uh, I thank, uh, thank the chairman. Uh, 
you know, as I said in my opening statement, you have been uh, firmly outspoken about monetary policy decisions. Uh, the Fed recently issued guidelines on how and when Federal Open Market Committee members should discuss or could discuss monetary policy decisions. Um, do you view this as an attempt to control the message or to uh, stifle dissenting voices? Uh, and uh, probably more importantly, uh, Chairman Bernanke has promised a, a more open Fed, a more transparent Federal Reserve. And um, do these, these guidelines, at least to me, seem a little inconsistent with uh, restrictions on your ability to speak out. But I'd, I'd like to know your views on that. Well, I, I hope not. I think part of the reason for the guidelines are that there were uh, instances, frankly, where I would wake up on a Thursday morning and find what the future policy might be in the Wall Street Journal not having known about it. And I think I raise objections to those kind of leaks and ask that they be vigorously pursued, to be quite frank. So I, I, I hope that's the reason. Secondly, um, my, my approach is that I speak publicly uh, on the record. I, I, I try not to speak off the record um, so that there isn't any confusion. And so when I come here or wherever I go, I speak my views. I, I don't consult with the Board of Governors. I don't ask permission. Um, now, I have till October, I realize, but I've never done so. And if I were staying on, I wouldn't do so in the future. So I, I, I think it's a matter of personal choice. I don't think any of the members should, dis should uh, disclose confidential information or leak to the media in advance. I strongly object to that. And I would have every intention to speak on the record my views uh, publicly, uh, regardless of what that statement might otherwise say. And I don't think that statement prevents me from doing so. Good. So the guidelines are more designed to keep unauthorized releases and uh, releases that aren't a part of the public record. That, that's the context in which they came up. Yeah. Um, well, that's now, they, I, now, the fact that they're there, I think, you know, can have the effect of stifling mm -hmm. some, but I think that's a matter of someone saying, I've mm -hmm. spoken to this, this is my view, uh, and show the leadership to, to speak their views. Okay, good. And I'm glad to hear that. I, I think uh, that uh, affirmation, I think Chairman Bernanke has tried to have a more open Fed, and, uh, and I think he's been very candid with our committee. Right. Um, in your testimony, uh, you used the rapid uh, increase in farmland uh, value as an example of maybe credit misallocation mm -hmm. uh, resulting from uh, what you see as a too low federal funds rate. Uh, do you see any other bubbles building? Well, I don't. You know, I don't. Uh, in fact, when people have asked me about the land, I've not said it's a bubble, but oh, I. Yeah. But I do say that we are. We have conditions. We've created conditions. Zero interest rates, QE1, QE2, create conditions that are amenable to bubbles, and where we see asset values moving quickly. One example is in the farmland. I think you can see it in other areas, some of the bond markets and so forth, and so you have to be aware of that. And and I think my issue is that when you create conditions for for certain outcomes, they will eventually arrive unless you withdraw those conditions uh, in a timely fashion. And then I think that's really the issue at hand. Okay. Uh, the uh, Fed used to say it specifically did not want to use monetary policy to reduce froth in the markets. Uh, Chairman Gre Greenspan said that in, said in front of this committee uh, any number of times, uh, I made that statement. But it is, appropriate, is it appropriate for the Fed to avoid dealing with the buildup of asset bubbles, but on the other hand, conduct monetary policy aimed at reflating uh, a market? I think my view is that monetary policy should be uh, conducted with a long-term focus with, if you will, boundaries around its discretion, and therefore should not be in a position of creating froth in the market any more than it should try and uh, somehow pinpoint some sector of the economy that they think is, or that it thinks is too frothy and try and adjust that. Okay. So, so really what you have to do is conduct monetary policy towards the long run. 
It's, it's when you try and um, fine tune monetary policy uh, directed towards per particular sectors or to offset every uh, short term decline in the economy with, ex with extensive easing of monetary policy that you create instability as likely as uh, uh, deal with it. Thank you. I, I'll come back in the second round and ask another. I do want to say this, and just, just for throwing out for thought and uh, not asking for a reply now, I have actually believed that uh, QE2 gave the Congress an opportunity to, uh, or some time, to move to make some long-term structural changes uh, in our entitlement programs. It, it's an opportunity that, I, whether it was intended for that purpose, it certainly gave us an opportunity. And I, I kept financing the debt at a low rate, or lower rate, maybe. But uh, uh, the Congress has squandered that opportunity, uh, at least to this time. So I, I do believe that uh, Chairman Bernanke's job has been made harder by the inability of this Congress to make the tough decisions, and uh, particularly to to, uh, uh, to make needed structural changes in our entitlement programs. And I, I think we will continue to, to uh, make problems for the Fed and uh, probably uh, result in uh, inflation ourselves, some of our actions. So well, thank you. I thank the gentleman. I yield five minutes to Mr. Green. Thank you. Again, I thank you for appearing today, sir. Let's start with the debt ceiling, and if you could be as uh, terse as possible, because I have a couple of other questions. Uh, can you give your opinion as to the consequences of our failure to raise the debt ceiling? And if you can be brief, I would appreciate it, although I know it's impossible on this question. Well, I mean, the, the failure to, to address your budget issues uh, is an action. It's a choice. And the consequences of, of doing that are to uh, add to the uncertainty in the economy. So the effects will be, I think, uh, in, in that sense, uh, adverse. I think the economy would do well with a, a addressing the, the budget crisis and the budget problems. and. Uh, providing more stability. In your more opinion, certainty. would it be better to not raise the debt ceiling or to raise it and have it done in what we call a clean fashion? Uh, if with those two choices, I know there are many others, but is it better to raise it and have a clean ra raising of the debt ceiling as opposed to not raise it at all? I, I mean, the only answer I can give you to that is you really need the Congress, that's the Congress's mm -hmm. area of responsibility. But I'm talking about you the need, consequences. So but you but, need to to deal with it uh, as forthrightly as possible. I understand, but the consequences, are the consequences more severe if we don't raise it than if we raise it with a, I, a clean ceiling? I Just think the, clean consequences, it's, the consequences are uh, there regardless. It's a matter of the timing of the consequences mm -hmm. and how you just so how you want to accept those. In your opinion, it could be just as bad to raise, to, to, to raise a debt ceiling as we've done in the past, just have a clean raising of the debt ceiling. That would be just as bad as not raising it at all? I, I don't know what the consequences will be any more than anyone else does. I know, frankly. but you're, you're in the business of prognosticating because that's, that's what you do to decide whether you should raise it to uh, the 1% uh, the well, I mean, that you're talking about I mean, if you want my here. prognosis, I, I, honestly, I think what you need to do is address the budget crisis. Uh, and I understand, but I, I'm not ready to go there, you see. I, I'm, I, I'm giving you a set of circumstances, and I'm asking you, if you would, to address this set of circumstances. I, I know what you would like to do. I've, I've been reading a little bit here, and I, I understand your point of view, but I'm, I'm taking you out of your comfort zone. And from time to time, but we it, do this. It's not mine to decide, it's yours. I don't want you to decide. I just want you to tell me about consequences of not deciding. Well, if you don't, if you don't raise the ceiling immediately, then the, uh, the Congress and whomever else has to prioritize its future cash flows. Mm -hmm. If you do raise it, you, can re you also right. will have to prioritize it over time. Well, let's let's go case, to another you have, area. You because have to make choices. I understand. My time is about up. Let me go to another area quickly. Um, you wanted to um, prepare the market for a 1% uh, increase 
um, by the fall of 2010. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Okay. If and you, that was in an earlier part of 2010. Okay. All right. I understand. The circumstances were different than, than now. Mm -hmm. But um, if, if we had done this, uh, we prepared the market as you uh, had hoped we would, what were your thoughts in terms of what would occur? Well, interest rates would still be uh, at historic low levels. Monetary policy would continue to be highly accommodative, but yet you would be off of zero. You would be no longer in, uh, pumping enormous amounts of liquidity into the market. And the, and the market would know, right now the market, what you're doing is you're, you're at zero. So you're creating, the market is adjusting to zero in all its allocations, in its investments, in its bond funds, in its land, around an equilibrium of zero. I think most people acknowledge that zero is not sustainable. So the longer you allow that to continue, the, lo the longer you allow that allocation of, of credit and assets around zero, the sharper, the more fragile the equilibrium and the sharper the consequences when you finally do remove that zero. Let and me, I think the let more me have harm a quick done follow up economy, because I've, sure. I've only got 30 plus seconds. Uh, you, you do agree that we don't have as much lending now as uh, we need for the economy to recover. And if we don't have that lending at zero, what would be the circumstance at 1%? I don't think that the issue around lending is related to the immediate uh, policy of the Fed funds rate being zero. It's around the issues of the fiscal uncertainty. It's around the issues of whether we have uh, a, a resurgence of manufacturing in this country that's sustainable. It's around the issues of uh, how we uh, uh, create goods because it's the creation of goods and services that, cr that bring jobs in. And I don't think that the marginal choice for most businesses uh, around whether they would do this uh, of zero or half a percentage point or one percentage point is the deciding factor in that instance. My, my time is up. And you've, you've been very generous, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank you, and I'll wait for a second round, thank and you. I'll follow up. I, I thank the gentleman. I'll yield myself now my five minutes. I want to talk about the relationship of the Federal Reserve policy and monetary policy with uh, the debt increase. We all know that the Federal Reserve is the lender of last resort. The economy gets into trouble liquidity dries up, the Fed is supposed to be there to help out. But could it be that this concept of lender of last resort contributes to the deficit problem? And what I'm thinking about here is that politicians, we in the Congress get pressure from a lot of areas to spend money, and sometimes spending money helps us get reelected. So there's a lot of domestic needs, uh, needs in our districts, and also there's a lot of activity around the world, both violent and nonviolent, requires a lot of money. And in the, in the inflationary part of the cycle, when things seem to be going well, it's, it's very tempting uh, for Congress to spend a lot of money. But if the Fed is always there uh, to keep interest rates low, doesn't that just encourage us? Uh, and we're, Congress generally is undisciplined. But doesn't the policy feed into this? Because if the Fed didn't do this, if they weren't our lender of last resort and interest rates started bumping up, we couldn't blame the Fed for our problems. We'd have to blame ourselves, high interest rates, because we're sucking up all the, all the credit. Do you see a relationship between Fed policy and the encouragement or the uh, allowing Congress to spend more than they should be? I think there is uh, always the danger that uh, the central bank can be put in a position of buying the government's debt. Now, that's why you have an independent central bank and why the independent central bank has to pursue long-run monetary policy geared towards what the basic money base requirements and needs are for the growth of that economy. And it, it does require not only that the Congress be disciplined, but that the central bank uh, be disciplined as well and not allow themselves to get drawn into that, yes. But in a way, uh, doesn't your testimony verify that maybe the Fed is, didn't do their job because, uh, uh, you know, they kept interest rates too low for too long and we were part of the problem. So but, how, how do you... How do you protect against that if the Fed is as fallible as the Congress? Well, there's, there's 
there's no system that's infallible, uh, whether it's uh, the central bank uh, doing this or the Congress doing it. There's no system that's infallible. What you have to, yes, I think that in the early part of the decade uh, of the 2000s that, um, as I've said many times, the policy was kept too accommodative too long. Uh, the consequence of that was to create a credit bubble. It affected not only the Congress, but of course the credit markets generally uh, became very uh, active. Uh, that's why we had the tremendous expansion in credit and housing and later the consequence. That is an area that we have to learn from uh, and, and go forward from. I don't think it's directly related uh, in terms of the Congress and the debt, but it is related to the economic uh, conditions broadly and the expansion of monetary policy during that period. And I think we have to be careful and mindful of that as a central bank. Well, I would agree that no system is uh, infallible, but uh, it, it seems like uh, we might get better information uh, from the marketplace, you know, dealing with interest rates. Uh, you know, pr prices are very important in the economy, and nobody's out there advocating uh, wage and price controls. Uh, we've tried it, and uh, hopefully they never bring that back again. But in a way, aren't we dealing with a price control, and you're looking for the price of money, the cost of money? And I think you talk about that, that the cost was too low, and this causes, uh, it causes uh, a misallocation of resources. So how do you know what the right price is? Well, you, that's, I agree. You need to have a disciplined monetary policy that is uh, has a range. I mean, our long-term growth over the over this decades have been about 3% real growth. Our policy should be mindful of that as it conducts, uh, as we conduct monetary policy going forward. And when we do go to zero and leave it there for an extended period, in reaction to a crisis, that's one thing. If we leave it there on a continuing basis, we do increase the risk that we misprice credit and misallocate resources, yes. Well, it seems like it's a contest between confidence in the market setting the price or the interest rates versus, uh, well, you know, somebody dealing with monetary policy. Right. And some of us have come to the conclusion that uh, we like the market to set that. We'd like to see maybe the retirees get more for, at the, in their, C, for their CDs. Right. I, and I understand. But, I mean, the market makes terrible mistakes as well. And the market is responsible because it gets... Uh, if you will, you fork in a direction, creates its own bubble around credit because we are a, a fractional reserve system. It crashes. The market itself isn't perfect either. It causes terrible. My, my, my time is up, but we're going to have a second round, and I want to ask about the fractional reserve okay. banking system. And uh, now I yield uh, by Mr. Mr. Lukenmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to my fellow Missourian. Thank you. Dr. Honig, it's good to have you. Thank you. Um, since 2008, the Fed's uh, purchased several trillion dollars worth of U.S. securities, treasury bills. And uh, as we've seen over in Europe, uh, over there, the, the countries, in order to get their debt sold, have had to go to some very austere measures, sometimes go back and two or three times to redo their plans. And every time, uh, their interest rates have gone up in order to be able to accommodate them. Uh, you know, we are being told by the credit markets, if we don't, do something within the next couple of weeks here, we're going to have our securities downgraded. How does that affect the solvency of the Federal Reserve to have the, all of those securities that they're holding all be downgraded suddenly? Well, it depends on how the markets view this downgrade. Uh, if, if it's downgraded and it doesn't affect the market pricing on those securities because they have confidence that the Congress of the United States will uh, come to a, a, a correct solution on that. I don't think it will have much effect at all on our, on our solvency. It, it, if, it, if the Congress fails to act, then it will have a more a lasting effect. But I assume int the Congress will act. As, as a former examiner, I'm sure you, uh, it would be interesting to have the Fed on the problem list, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> along that line, though, uh, you know, the same thing's happening with, with the rest of the banks in this country. If for instance, we did get downgraded. Suddenly now those banks, so your local community banks, got a whole fistful of U.S. Treasuries, and now they're being downgraded. And suddenly uh, that, that affects their capital, it affects their rating, 
uh, how would you view that situation then? You're, again, as a farmer examiner, uh, the, 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 the calamity that would happen to our local community banks. Well, if, if there was uh, a serious effect from the downgrade on the pricing of the bonds, to where there was capital loss in the bank, then of course it would have uh, negative effects. Whether, I think the question is whether there would be a pricing effect and I think that depends very much on the actions of the Congress. But it is, a, it is, a, it is a, an action that could happen on the part of the credit markets to where it, it could be a, a, an in, increase in risk the, that the, would have to be uh, assumed there. The, f the failure to act is an action. Okay, thank you. Um, with regards to, uh, you mentioned a while ago, um, well, let me, let me get, my time's running out here, let me get, get to QE3. Um, we had Chairman Bank in here not too long ago, and, and he wouldn't say anything about QE3, but since he's been here, he certainly has not denied thinking about QE3. And to me, it, this, is, this is a devastating situation. We've had a number of economists in here since he's been here, and every one of them I've asked the same question is what happens? Uh, do you see the interest rates going up this fall as soon as QE2 stops here? And every one of them has said yes unless you do a QE3, in which case you probably have inflation. Would you, would you concur with that, or do you have a different opinion on that? Well, I would, I, first of all, I'm not a supporter of QE3. I wasn't a supporter of QE2. Uh, I think uh, by ceasing QE2, I don't know that necessarily interest rates will go up significantly. It depends on a whole host of factors in, in terms of how the economy is doing. It's not just whether you uh, stop QE2 over time. Uh, and yeah, but Dr. I, Hunter, I, don't, I don't think we should manage, try and manage interest rates down. That's kind of the point mm -hmm. of my testimony. Um, uh, I think there are consequences of doing that uh, that misallocate resources, and we have to be mindful of that. Well, obviously, you know, I, I, I'm, I agree with that. I, I'm just uh, going along that line of thought, though. Mm -hmm. along, one of the things that, that's the Fed's job is to look long term with regards to uh, interest rates, with regards to unemployment, and to me, this would seem to fit into, you know, QE2, QE3. I mean, where, where do we stop this? At some point, we have to get control of the, you know, at some point, the economy's got to be resilient enough to, to stand on its own two feet. You've right. got to wean them off this. I mean, if we're going to go out here and absorb all the debt that we're incurring, and every budget was Democrat, Republican, or whoever, we got debt out there. Everybody's agreeing we have to have more, we're going to have more debt. So we're going to have to have somebody purchase it. And if the, the Fed doesn't purchase it, somebody else is going to have Correct. to. And if we get our securities downgraded, I mean, risk is there. Interest rates are going to necessarily go up. So, uh, long term, how do you how do you how do you manage those monies to see that that you can minimize that? What would be your idea or solution? I, I think the, the the mandate is a long term mandate, and we need to keep that in mind. <clears throat> and if we do, and if we pursue a policy that is long run oriented towards price stability, uh, then the the economy, I mean, a market economy adjusts on its own. The, the market is not particularly brilliant, but it is harsh. I mean, it, it corrects itself when there is an allocate, misallocation. And so that's why monetary policy has to look to the long run, provide sufficient liquidity, but not, not, not try and fine tune or manage the economy so that markets can, in fact, discipline themselves. So we should not be doing QE3, in my, this is my view. Uh, we should let, there's plenty of excess reserves out there. Uh, in the order of $2 trillion. I think that's plenty. Now let the markets begin to heal uh, and let this market of ours allocate resources in our economy, and we should not try and fine-tune that. Uh, I think when, when we do that, we inject instability as well, more likely than we do uh, uh, stability. So we have to be very mindful of that. In the, the short run, we can really uh, inject instability. We have to have a long-run focus, and that, that is hard, I realize, but necessary. Thank you for your comments, and thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. I thank the gentleman. Oh, I recognize Mr. Lucas for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Doctor, as you're well aware, of course, I live uh, in uh, the great uh, Kansas City District in western Oklahoma, and about the time you were out doing all that hard work in the early 1980s, I was a senior at Oklahoma State. And I'll always think of my father's lecture in the spring of 82 when I would occasionally go to land sales with my grandfather, keep your hands in your pockets and your mouth shut. <laughs> well, it was wonderful advice in 1982. Yeah. The reason I bring that up is we are now dealing with a set of circumstances here that you've discussed and touched around on the edges that in some ways is reminiscent of those early 1980s. You remember 
And sometimes there's an occasional view here that nothing is interconnected, that we're all little islands in the world. You remember when Penn Square Bank went down, an energy concentrated uh, banking establishment, which then took down, directly or indirectly, uh, what, Continental Illinois and Chicago, took down Sea First in uh, Seattle, took down two major historic long-term players. Partly, uh, partly that, uh, in my opinion, and you can offer yours and I'd be pleased to hear it, as a result of perhaps misguided uh, fiscal policy by Congress and perhaps misguided monetary policy by the Fed in that late 70s and early 80 period. But it had a devastating consequence and it wasn't just Oklahoma that imploded. We sucked people under with us. Yes. So I guess that brings you to my real question and whatever comments you'd care to offer. As my colleagues have alluded to, with the Fed balance sheet at a little under $3 trillion now, yeah. which uh, by even the Texans' definitions, Mr. Chairman, that's a lot of money. It took us 15 years to recover from the ag and energy sector hangover from credit. Uh, that started in 1982. In my opinion, in my quadrant, it was 1997 before the ship righted itself. Three trillion dollars is a whole hell of a lot more credit than Penn Square was manipulating. When the right policy decisions are made, how long is it going to take this credit hangover to clear? Well, let me first comment. Uh, I, I was on the discount window on Penn Square and was part of the group that recommended against lending against Penn Square, and I think it was the right decision there, although the consequences, as you said, were very harsh. And for the record, a few officers at Penn Square did go to the federal penitentiary. They so did. more than just a few bad decisions. Absolutely. Um, now, to your question of the, the, the degree of liquidity, the, number, the, the amount of time it will take to bring the, the liquidity off our balance sheet, the three trillion, I think is reasonably a period of years. Uh, because we have brought this on. I think if you bring it out too sharply, you will shock the economy. Uh, and in our last uh, minutes, the Open Market Committee talked about <clears throat> how they would go about doing it in terms of rates and, and no longer uh, renewing their debt instruments. But even under those, it will take years. How many? Depends on how the economy does. It depends on what the roll-off of these instruments, the speed of the roll-off of these instruments, and whether we choose to sell those. I don't know how long, other than I know it will take years. And there are risks to doing that. I re and that's my point about zero interest rates and creating what I call fragile equilibriums around this very liquid policy that when you finally do begin to move uh, has, a, has a negative effect a negative consequence on the economy, both nationally and regionally, and that does uh, get my attention. Fair statement to say, Doctor, that uh, of course we will make at some point a decision here. We will at some point, I hope, achieve a consensus. We have legitimate disagreements within the ranks of the House over what the right policy is. Right. That's the nature of the body. Right. But at some point, we will arrive at something. If we make the wrong decision, whatever decision we come to, are the consequences as frightening as I suspect they are? Well, any time... Without make, commenting on any particular decision. Right. Any time you make a wrong decision, there are usually negative consequences. And if you make the wrong decision, there will be negative consequences, whatever that is. And the financial markets are sophisticated enough that they will respond moment by moment with whatever policy decisions we make and will, as prudent money managers, use what I would define from an Oklahoma perspective as defensive policies if they need to, and that well, will ripple too. Well, the, the, greater you, the greater uncertainty you create, the more defensive the actions will be, and that much we can be sure of. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the time that I have I, left. I thank the gentleman. We will go ahead and start a second round of questioning. If, if we look at the markets in the last couple of weeks, in light of all the conversation about whether or not the uh, debt limit will be raised, my, my uh, estimation or my observation is that uh, the markets aren't that worried. Would, would you agree with that, or do you think the markets are showing problems, or at least potential problems? Well, 
to this point, I think the markets uh, are, at least give, strike me as um, having the view that there will be a solution. And as long as that view is in place, they will tend to stay calm. Um, if they lose that or if they begin to see uh, uh, more un instability, more uncertainty around it, and therefore actions, then they would, uh, they, as I said earlier, take more defensive actions. Um, but right now, I think they have confidence in you, the Congress, uh, and the President to come to uh, some kind of a agreement. In monetary history, it's been said that when countries get to a certain level of debt, they have a lot of trouble and, and the debt eventually has to be liquidated. I personally think we're at that point, so there will be liquidation of debt. Matter of fact, free market individuals uh, recognize that uh, whether it's government debt or whether it's private debt, liquidation actually serves a purpose in order to get back to square one and have economic growth again. Now, when, when we liquidate debt, I, I believe I mentioned in my open statement, you can do it, do, it, you can do it in two different ways. You can just default, which great nations don't do that, uh, small nations will. But we're nowhere close, do I believe, that we will do that. I don't believe that for a minute. But I do worry about the other part. I worry about the liquidation of debt, because if it is inevitable that the debt will be liquidated, and what we do may be prolonging the agony, that's what I worry about, that instead of allowing uh, the liquidation and rapidly getting back to square one like we did in 1921, that we prolong this, such as Japan did and such as we did in the 30s. Um, do, you, do you agree with that? And do you have concerns that uh, the liquidation will come in the form of inflation? And if you want to prevent that, what, do you, what are your other options if we're not going to uh, default on our payments, which, of course, I don't believe we will? Well, first of all, I agree with you. I don't think great nations default on their debt. Second of all, I, I say that I agree with you also. We have leveraged our economy. Uh, as I mentioned in my remarks, the consumer has raised their debt to disposable income from 80 to 90 percent to 125. The federal government has raised its debt to, in gross numbers, 100 percent of GDP. So we have increased our debt. Now, my concern is that, maybe back to your earlier point perhaps, but when you have that kind of debt, over time, there is increased pressure on the central banks to help uh, relieve that debt pressure by uh, helping finance that debt. Uh, that puts pressure on the central bank. If they do that, it does risk inflationary outbreak, and then you, you basically uh, repay your debt in cheaper dollars. But is it that, that's a risk. So how do you avoid that? The, the way you avoid that is you take either through the Congress, through special committees, whatever, and develop a long-run plan that shows how we are going to, shows the American people how we're going to deal with our debt, federal and otherwise, but in the Congress, federal debt, and how the debt-to-GDP ratio is going to be brought back down. And if it does that in a systematic fashion with strong uh, binding points, then you will take care of the debt in a responsible way. But it seems to me like in that attempt, and the Fed came in, and they, you know, propped up banks and corporations, that they were the ones that had been benefited from this, and now they have, you, you know, been able to uh, get back on their feet again. At the same time, it really didn't help the people. The jobs didn't come back, and the people lost their houses. So it seems like it's a failed policy to me. Well, my, your point, I understand your point, and my concern is that we have in this country allowed to develop too big to fail institutions. The largest financial institutions who uh, bulked their assets became so important to the economy that anyone would fa any one of them that failed would bring down and risk the economy. That the market understood that and therefore gave them an advantage in terms of their position in the market, lowered the cost of capital, allowed them un uh, unfettered access. And when we allow that part, the safety net portion of that, to get in with the high risk portion, the investment bank, it only uh, increased that by factors. 
So we do need to address the issue of too big to fail. We do need to think about how we separate out the safety net from the high risk so that the economy can function under a market discipline or at least more under market discipline, and we would all benefit from that. Okay. I think that's my, my a very five legitimate minutes, concern. My five minutes are up, and I now you to Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be honored to let you have 30 seconds of my five minutes <laughs> if you need it. Uh, <clears throat> Let's talk for a moment about the lowering the uh, debt to GP, GDP ratio. Uh, do you agree that there's more than one way to do it? Of course. Do you agree that cutting is a way to do it? Uh, well, you can grow your economy. Or grow the economy. You could also increase revenue. Of, of course. I mean, okay. that's up to the Congress how they I understand. But I, I just want you to be on record as indicating that, that we have more ways to do it than one. Right. And every choice has a consequence. Every choice has consequences, and uh, not making a choice at all has its consequences as well. That, that is a choice. Sorry. Yes, sir. Now, uh, let's move to another area. Uh, you talked about markets and the markets being calm. You do agree that the markets, generally speaking, don't like big surprises. Uh, when, you, when you give the market a big surprise, it has a reaction to a surprise. If you lead the market to believe that you're going in one direction, and if you go in another direction, then the market responds. Correct. Uh, I think one of the best examples of this occurred when we had the $700 billion TARP vote, and the market anticipated one thing, and when the vote went another way, we saw the market spiral downward. Uh, you recall that, I'm sure. So sure. you, you, you agree that markets don't, generally speaking, want to be shocked with surprises? Correct. Okay. If this is true, um, and you've indicated that the market currently believes that we're going to resolve this, and, and by the way, I, I pray that we will, but uh, you agree that failure to, to bring about the resolution that the market anticipates will create a reaction in the market. Sure, it, it, it certainly will. If, if the market is thinking one thing and you do something else, there will be a reaction. All right. um, one final and That thing. also happens on Main Street. Yes, <laughs> and Home Street as well. As well. Uh, yes, uh, but uh, let's go back now to your support for the uh, 0 to 0.25 target. Uh, I, don't su I do not support it. You, you, you do not support it, uh, but in 2008, you supported the cuts uh, in the federal fund rate that pushed us to this target range, did you not? Uh, well, I wasn't voting, but I'm sure I would have supported it, yes. Okay. And, and uh, by the way, reasonable people can have opinions that differ Absolutely. even on the things that you supported, true? Absolutely. And uh, Mr. Bernanke, whom I happen to think highly of, uh, and I have a great deal of respect for, uh, and uh, he, he has opinions that are very well respected, and uh, there are other members of the board with opinions, and right. you meet and you confer and you vote, and, and then uh, you come to conclusions. Correct. Uh, so at the time, what you were trying to do was provide what I'm going to call a soft landing. Is that a fair statement, that we didn't want the economy to just crash? Uh, well, we I, wanted I, it to, to land a, a little bit uh, softer than if we had done nothing at all? Soft landing is a generous term. I think we did want to avoid a crash and depression, yes. Yes, a crash and a depression. And if, if you say that you wanted to avoid it, it says to me that you are of the opinion that had we not acted, there could have been a crash and a depression. Uh, is that a fair statement? Are, counterfactuals are always there, and that's a possibility, yes. Yes, sir. And, and counterfactuals are hard to prove. Right. Um, but th the reason you acted the way you did was because there was this concern, and I'm being kind by saying concern because there are a lot of other ways to, to connote what was happening, but uh, there were these concerns that we were headed for of uh, something close to a crash or depression. And uh, your actions, uh, probably, if you were to, uh, to write a book, you'd say that your actions helped to avert this, would you not? If you're speaking of our movement to zero uh, interest rates and the liquidity we provided? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. That liquidity was helpful. Yes. And uh, just as it is difficult to prove the counter 
factual uh, as it relates to what you did uh, is equally as difficult to prove it with reference to what Congress has done. Uh, do you agree? Oh, I assume so, yes. Okay, all right. I'm, what I'm trying to do is establish this, sir. People of goodwill, and I consider you a person of goodwill, sure. acted at a time of crisis. Correct. A time when it appeared as though we were about to go over the edge into an abyss unlike we had, many of us had seen in our lifetimes. And uh, many of these things that we did, we, we, will, we won't be able to prove that we averted a, a, a great uh, cataclysm, but we can surely uh, conclude that what we did probably helped to avoid a rougher landing, a, a, a harder landing than we had. Right. And I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Now I yield to Mr. Lukemeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Honig, um, I've been watching what's going on in Europe very carefully, and it's very concerning to me. And I know that in discussing this issue with a couple of other Fed members, board members, um, uh, they don't seem to be quite as concerned about it as I am. So maybe I'm an alarmist here. I don't know. But I, I certainly see. Uh, a contagion there that could easily spread to this country, especially whenever you look at our banks having about $1.3 trillion loan to the various governments to, uh, in, invested in bonds and the various governments over there, as well as now Dodd-Frank tying all those big banks together with too big to fail. I mean, it looks like there's a lot of connectivity between all of these things here, and you look at a line of dominoes, and it looks like we're in that line of dominoes. So uh, I know that the Fed has a, a swap line with the European Central Bank and uh, perhaps some other reserve banks over there as well. And uh, just wondering what your view is of that situation. How concerned are you? Well, I'm, I'm concerned. Uh, you mean about the European situation? Yeah, European situation uh, and how it, in, how it will affect us or what kind of exposure we might have, uh, you know, our monetary policy, how it interacts. I mean, it's kind of a big question, but well, just I mean, take parts I of it. I understand your, your concern. I, I mean, the issues around uh, th those countries uh, that keep coming up are also really around the banks, uh, the European banks, uh, because they obviously have um, uh, exposure there, and that's a, a big part of the efforts they're trying to do to resolve this. And like the United States, uh, as I read it, and I only know from what I read in the paper, uh, they're working towards uh, some kind of solution, resolution uh, around that. But I think. Uh, it proves to me, not only in the United States but internationally, that we have institutions that are too big to fail. And that's what this is really about. Uh, we've taken the market discipline away. Uh, we are now working with institutions globally that are extremely important to those economies, to our economy. Uh, and, you know, to me, the whole issue continues to be around institutions that are so large that their own uh, uh, difficulties have effects, broad effects on the economy, and that makes them too big to fail, and therefore forces, if you will, uh, governments to come in and bail them out. And that's really what I think is going on in Europe, and that's really what has, in our crisis, gone on in the United States. Until we change that formula, until we uh, better uh, con um, uh, until we break those institutions up into those that are under the safety net and those that are allowed to engage in high-risk activities, we will have these uh, crises uh, periodically uh, into the future. Not right away, perhaps, but in years to come. And, and, the, and the, the, the pitfall there is that we've got our taxpayer dollars at risk because we are backing these too-big-to-fail folks. Is that right. not When you put a safety net over them and uh, put put the government's uh, implied or explicit guarantee, the taxpayer is the backstop, yes. In your position, having, and you're an economist, and having dealt with all of the financial things uh, over the last several years, what do you see as the biggest concern to our economy today? I mean, whether it's uh, international problems here we just discussed, or oil prices, or our monetary policy, or wars, or you know, what, what do you see as the biggest concern and, and how we can uh, go to it, I mean, from the financial aspect? I, well, um, that's a pretty important question. I, number one, I, I think that um, as far as our uh, financial system goes, I continue to believe that too big to fail is an area that needs further 
to be further addressed and these institutions need to have their risk better divided uh, between what's under the safety net and what's not. Uh, number two, I think that the, the fiscal, the budget crisis in the United States is important because it's drawing all of our attention into that. And yet the economy is in difficulty and we, we should be thinking about our policies that do we want to see if we can bring manufacturing back on, greater manufacturing on, sh on shore. In 1960, 25 percent of our GDP was contributed by manufacturing. Today it's 12.5 percent. We have 14 people, million people out of work. So what is our attitude towards manufacturing? What is our attitude towards creating businesses to create things then that hire people? By not being able to pay attention to that in the Congress and elsewhere, I think we are uh, handicapping ourselves in an international global competitive market, and we need to pay more attention to it uh, so we have a brighter future. I think that's essential. Appreciate your comments. My time is up. Thank you again for visiting with us today. I always enjoy discussing uh, things with you. I, I really appreciate your perspective and all your hard work as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you again for your service, sir. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the Chairman. I'm, I have another additional question. If you care, just stick around. You may. But uh, I'm not going to let you go so easy. I have you here, so I want to—I I need to find some answers. <laughs> but I am very glad you're here and, and willing to take our questions. But, I, I, uh, you know, in your introductory statement, you mentioned that one of the responsibilities of the Federal Reserve was to have uh, maximum employment, uh, which sounds like a good idea, and stable prices. And I would look around and I would say, you know, results aren't all that good. Uh, when you look at uh, stable prices of housing, you even brought up the subject of stable prices, unstable prices in farmland. That quite possibly could be a bubble. I would think that if you looked at bonds in prices, they, they are very unstable, uh, and uh, and who knows where that is going? You know, if if the market o overrides, which I believe is possible, uh, markets are very very powerful. I know the Fed's very powerful, but I also know markets are very powerful. But also in your statement, I want to get back to it. We talked a little bit about this, and you said, I, you, I have several concerns with zero rates. First, a guarantee of zero rates affect the allocation of resources. To me, I think that uh, is very key and very important because it, it really brings up the subject that uh, the free market economists are, are very attuned to. And Mises, in his human action, talks about this, his, uh, the misallocations and the malinvestment, the excessive debt, uh, money going into the wrong seg sectors, right. like farmland maybe, or NASDAQ right. uh, bubbles and houses. Uh, but but he, he took that and carried it a much further step. It seems like you have part of that philosophy, but not the full philosophy. But you're, I'm sure, aware of uh, what Mises says about the uh, Austrian uh, theory of the business cycle. Sure. Um, how, do you, how do you look at that? Can you say something favorable about his approach to it? Or can you draw a sharp line uh, where interest rates are harmful and know how to divide the two? And uh, what, what is your opinion of the Austrian business cycle theory? Well, I've read, I've read Human Action. I, I have a lot of respect for von Mises, and I have a lot of respect for the Austrian school of, of thinking. I think um, uh, it, it, has, it has value. Uh, I, I understand that when you overinvest, when you leave things artificially low and you overinvest, you create, you create a correction by doing that. There's an action with that. Uh, my, my view is um, that that's why central banks uh, have to be mindful. I mean, you're all, no matter what the system is, if you have markets and capitalism, you're going to have cycles and you're going to have crises. And what you want the central bank to do is address the crises and provide, over a long period of time, a base liquidity of money that allows your economy to grow. When you move beyond that, when you find the central bank focusing on short-term issues, trying to manage the economy, trying to fine-tune it, then you create if you will, impulses of instability because you're trying to yeah. take care of short run issues instead of looking to the long run. That's why when I say the duty of a central banker is to think long run. And that I think I'm in agreement with, with the Austrian school. Uh, but I do think there is a role for central banks, I, uh, I, as I've said. I certainly agree that, uh, with your point. Once they overextend, they're into central economic planning, except many of them accept the notion that uh, 
you get into central economic planning earlier than that uh, at the initial stages of, of, of uh, believing that uh, uh, you can know what the interest rate should be. Uh, maybe you can give me a quick comment on this. Do you think uh, the problems in the world today, uh, try to put that in perspective. I think it's a very big problem because I don't think we've faced it quite the same way because we have a fiat dollar standard and we are the issuers of the reserve currency of the world. Mm -hmm. Do you think that has had an effect uh, on, on what we're facing? Uh, do you, uh, the fact that we're issuing the reserve currency in the world and it's much different than anything we faced before? What I, what I think is that the fact that we're the reserve currency is a consequence of decades of very good economic policy. The fact that we've had an economy that has grown, become uh, very important to the world, and therefore its currency has become very important. I think that's a consequence. It's something you, as someone also said, you've earned. Uh, that, with that car is carried a responsibility, a responsibility to, to look to long-run long policy. And to your point, I mean, if you, if you have a gold standard, uh, that's, that is a legitimate uh, alternative mon uh, monetary uh, base uh, for your economy. But it, it, does not, it does not eliminate crisis. There's gold hoarding, there's mm -hmm. positioning, there's mercantile practices. You, have, you will have crises. So it, all, it doesn't matter if it's Congress. It doesn't matter if it's the central bank. It doesn't matter what standard it is. Good policy leads to good outcome. Bad policy leads to bad outcomes. See, That's what you have to keep in mind. See, I question the word whether we earned it or not. I, in some ways, I think it, it was defaulted, you know, because we were the standard. At least we pretended to uh, be a gold reserve standard. Uh, even though we weren't allowed to own gold, it was an international gold standard. And then the confidence continued, surprisingly, to some people. Uh, so that that's just a matter of an understanding or semantics about whether it was earned or we default into it. But I have one more question. Sure. Because I've been interested in the monetary issues, I'm delighted that you're here and so willing to uh, uh, visit with us. But, uh, you know, last week I learned that uh, gold was not money. So I've been able to put that out of my mind. Uh, so gold is not money. So I'm still trying to figure out what money is. And and I've asked these questions a lot of times. I've asked the Federal Reserve uh, Board Chairman over the years. And uh, if I ask about dollar policy, they would say, well, we're not in charge of dollar policy. They're in charge of creating all this money and regulating interest rates, but they're not in charge of the dollar. Secretary of Treasury does that. But the Secretary of the Treasury doesn't give me any straight answers. But what I need to know from you in, or if, if, to further my education is tell me, tell me what a dollar is and where can I find the definition in our code? Well, the, the, the denomination is, I think, uh, or the title was given back at the just about the founding of our country. It was based on a gold standard at that time. But money is, as you know, a medium exchange, deferred uh, means of payment and store of value. And as long as the public and the world understands that the dollar that is uh, produced by the central bank of the United States, the base money, and then credit goes on beyond that, uh, it is money. As long as they take it as a medium exchange, deferred payment, and store value. But when that's it, lost, then it will no longer be money. But, but it's a note. It's a promise to pay. It, it actually, you're, you're right about but it. The, but it, 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 but it fills the three functions of money. But now, gold can do the same thing. And if Congress designated that the gold, gold was the medium exchange, well, then This is why I'm looking for the code, because the code, when I understand it, uh, actually, the, in the early years, they wrote a dollar into the Constitution like they would write a yard, because everybody knew what it was. They didn't even define it. It was so well known. It was 371 grains of silver. But that's never been changed, the best I can tell. And all of a sudden now, we have a Federal Reserve note, a promise to pay nothing, is now the dollar standard, and we can create them at will out of thin air. And, and then sometimes people wonder why we have a, sh a shaky, rocky uh, economy. But um, I'll keep looking, uh, you know, for the definition of a dollar. But uh, best I can tell, we've never said a dollar is a Federal Reserve note. And the dollar under the, under the code still says it's 371 grains of silver. I yield uh, to Mr. Lukemeyer. I just have one follow-up question on, on something the chairman asked a minute ago with regards to the world currency. 
because I think one of the consequences of us not doing something uh, to resolve our debt crisis here uh, and then be downgraded, it would seem to me to be a step down the path toward allowing ourselves to be no longer the world's reserve currency, with China sitting over the sidelines watching us twiddle our thumbs and waiting for an opportunity to, to, to get in the game, uh, this is an opportunity. We're, we're stumbling here and allowing them to do that. What would be your thoughts on that comment? Well, I think it's, I, I do think it's a serious matter. I think the, I think the U.S. currency, the dollar, uh, is, is the reserve currency of the world and remains so for some time. And part of it is, what's your alternatives? I mean, you always have to ask the question. And uh, the United States, for all of our issues and all the debate going on right now is still, uh, has the deepest markets, is a market economy, has all the advantages. It has open capital markets. China doesn't have that. Europe has its issues. So we, we still are the, the dominant economy. However, there, there's, nothing, there's nothing guaranteed about that. Well, I mean, that just... can change based upon the policies we choose going forward from here, both from a fiscal side and from a monetary side. and from basically how we choose to have our economy operate in terms of the private sector and markets. Uh, those will all define uh, the future of us as an economy and therefore the future of us as a nation with, as a reserve currency. It's, it will be what we choose to do. You just, you just made the case from the standpoint that you, almost by default, we are the real reserve currency because China doesn't have all its ducks in a row yet to be that currency. Europe's got its own set of problems. And right. so you look for the safest harbor, you look for the, right. the strongest uh, economy, we're still there. But if we, we, and, you know, if we keep twiddling our thumbs right. here, it that, could be endangered from the standpoint the world still looking and say, well, those guys can't get their act together. And their, their economy is still alone. They don't have a manufacturing base anymore. Right. And they're going to import almost all the oil, which means they're going to be at, at mercy of the oil companies and, and all, uh, the oil cartels around the world. And all of a sudden, our economy is looked at as kind of a, a shaky thing versus right. a very stable thing. And now, you know, you have those other folks come running in there and fill the void. And I, to me, this, this debt debate one of the things, one of the side lights and one of the side consequences is that we're, we're, we're going down this road that nobody's thinking about of, in, of, of allowing China to get their foot in the door on the world currency side. Now, it's not going to happen today or tomorrow, but I've heard some people project that, you know, five or ten years, if we don't get our fiscal house in order, by that time they will be in a position economically where they've resolved a lot of the issues that you talked about, and they may be knocking on the door. So I, I agree. What do, you, what, do you, what do you see in the horizon for that? I, th I think that the, the debates that are going on right now are about the long-run future of this country, yeah. how we choose to deal with our debt, how we choose to deal with our economy going forward. Those are the debates that are in place right now. And I, my point is a monetary policy cannot manage the short run. It has to have a long-run focus also, and the Congress and how we choose to uh, have our markets operate are choices that lie ahead of us. And if we don't choose well, I think we, in a generation, uh, I think the answer to that question could be different. So we, it's in our power to change this, or to, to keep us on the right path, but you have to choose to do it. And these debates are about the long run. There's no question about it. Well, I certainly appreciate your common sense and intellectual approach to all of our problems, Dr. Honig, and I hope that you stay engaged in some in some aspect I hope so, of, of monetary and fiscal and economic policy here. You're, you're too much of a, of a prize jewel to, to walk away from this. So thank you again for your, your, your service. No, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Much. Thank you very much. Uh, we're about to close, but I do have one more sure. short question. I think you can answer it rather quickly. <laughs> what would be the ramifications if they uh, stripped away the voting rights of the regional uh, Fed presidents uh, from the FOMC? Well. The ramifications would be you'd lose an important set of voices in the Federal Open Market Committee. And uh, I, th I think it would be uh, a mistake. I mean, you know, right now in, the, in my region, uh, as I deal with our board, uh, agriculture from uh, a rancher from uh, Wyoming, bookseller in Oklahoma, labor leader in Omaha, that's all input that comes into the process. And I, I think it would, you would lose that voice and you would lose that input. And, and you can say, make them advisors, but let me just tell you, voting and advising are two different things and they're not even close to one another. Mm -hmm. I would just say, I, since, you've, since you've asked, I mean, I've been, I've been said, you know, it's, it's, it's not democratic, it's not part of the political process. And my answer has been, 
the selection of my successor will be a process that relies on our board who represent, like I said, a, a, a grain dealer in Kansas City, a, a entrepreneur in, in, in Denver, a labor leader, a bookseller, a manufacturer, uh, uh, and a, a, a rancher from all over our region, six of our seven states. Uh, and they very carefully go through a search and then it has to be approved by the Board of Governors, the political appointees. So to me, that's a very democratic process. And it, it is in contrast to if you select the Secretary of Treasury, who happened to, if you're a Democrat, you select a uh, former chairman of Goldman Sachs and you're Republican and you select a chairman from Goldman Sachs, that's political, but I don't know that it's any more democratic than our process and I don't recommend it. I, I thank you. I thank you for being here. This uh, hearing is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.